first of all, thank you guys for joining me today. Um, and congratulations on Wired Shut. I love the movie. Um, and so first of all, you know, it's such an anxiety inducing concept, the idea of this guy's jaw being wired shut. I was watching it and freaking out. Um, how did you guys come up with this concept and develop the script? Alex, you want to take yeah. it? Yep, I'll start. Sure. Yeah. So um, we we had done a bunch of shorts together and we knew that we wanted to uh, do a feature as our next project. So we kind of reverse engineered the story a little bit. You know, we knew that we it needed to be contained, have one or two locations, minimal characters and something we could do realistically on a shoestring. And we both love the home invasion thriller subgenre. We both watched Cape Fear at the same time. And that was a big influence for us on this movie. So we were looking for the, the concepts like, okay, how can we do a home invasion thriller that's interesting that hasn't quite been done before? And then a, a person in my life was going through the exact same surgery that Reed had in the movie. And I was watching her go through this and not being able to talk and drinking out of straws. And it's like, well, wait a minute, there's something there. Wait a minute, what if we put this situation in the most dire situation possible and your life depended literally on not being able to talk? And then it kind of just snowballed from there, yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, like I said, I, especially the scene where he like rips his jaw open, I just couldn't, I mean, it was just, that was a lot. <laughs> um, but, you know, you mentioned Cape Fear. Um, I also got like shades of like David Fincher's Panic Room a little bit, and then uh, Mike Flanagan's Hush about uh, the deaf woman who's ah. being attacked by uh, like a home invader. Um, but what, I was wondering what other films were on your mind while you were uh, writing it and directing it? Uh, both of you. Well, I know that misery was on Peter's mind. Um, uh, certainly, you know, with the with the idea of a writer uh, incapacitated in a mountain home. Yep. Um, uh, it, it I'm so glad you mentioned Hush because we watched that, and at the time we before COVID kind of had the industry shut down, and we changed our game, and we decided to go with distribution. We were going to go to festivals. And Peter said, you know, this one horror film, this one home invasion, which is amazing, Hush, it came out of South by Southwest. Am I correct, Peter? South by Southwest? Yep. yep. Yeah. And so we watched that together and we, and so we, we kind of did our due diligence of looking at uh, different movies that had been done in the genre. Uh, Panic Room is certainly an influence for me. Um, uh, definitely giving the house in the film a character. Uh, yeah. I wanted that mountaintop house that Reed is in to be a character in and of itself. So the howling wind outside. And then when you're inside, it's almost like you can hear the bowels of the thing and it's under the floorboards and, you know, it's a guttural sort of howling inside. And so, um, uh, and then lastly for me was again, Cape Fear. Um, I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but it was that Max Cady element that mm -hmm. Peter and I fell in love with. Robert De Niro's Max Cady is, in my opinion, sort of the ultimate villain in a movie like this because he's terrifying, but he's so entertaining to watch and he's so deliciously evil that you can't wait to see him again. And so we wanted to do that with Preston and we wanted to have some fun. You know, it's, it's a little over the top. He definitely goes off the deep end psycho, but that was kind of the fun of it, you know? Yeah, and it was a fine balancing act because, you know, yeah, I mean, it's super elevated and heightened and, and whatnot, but it also grounding it in a sense. So he wasn't just a mustache twirling villain. That was the, the balancing act that I got to play with in the script. So I really got to push the, the envelope in terms of what I could do with Preston. It was, it was a lot of fun for me. It was very challenging, but Baytash did a great job with it. So I'm, I'm super happy with the way it came out. Yeah, and, and like you said, Alex, um, you know, the house does become its own character. And, you know, in those in these single location films, it's like so important that, yep. you know, the setting is very grounded and very fully realized. So I was like very curious, like, how did you guys find the location? Did you guys go scouting or did you know somebody who like owned the house and you were like, hey, can we just borrow this for for a week? <laughs> It was, it was the latter, actually. <laughs> and, and funny enough, I, I, I'm trying to be concise with this one, but um, we had a couple connections and there was a house that was not yet sold. And we knew the real estate agent, we knew the uh, contractor, family, friends, and it was being taken off the market uh, and not being shown for two weeks in March. And so Peter and I were like, hey, can we get in there with a, with a camera and a crew of 14? And, 
and 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 they were like, "Sure, what are you what are you shooting?" And I said, "Oh, you know, it's a story about a father and a daughter." <laughs> I didn't tell them that we were going to be running around. So now it's been sold, the house. Oh, okay. And my <laughs> hope is is that whoever bought it will be sitting on that couch watching the movie and go, "Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the dream. I didn't realize that it it's sold. That's 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 good. That's good. And yeah. then work for a while. Sorry, my dog. We didn't break anything. Get up and move around. <laughs> <Get> me. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah. And then Alex, I was going to ask you too. You know, with this being your first full feature length, um, you know, staying in that one location. I did you find that like more like constraining, or I mean, sometimes you know when we are constrained as artists to like one location that can also be more freeing. So I was wondering how that worked for you filming in this one single place. It definitely was, uh, it, it was it was a really, really good exercise and it was a great, um, it was a great segue for me. Um, you know, uh, doing a feature, I had done a number of shorts with multiple locations for each and tried to cram in as much as possible um, in anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. And then Peter and I were like, we got to do a feature. Um, and I approached this the same way. And it was really a blessing to do just a contained thing because features are hard enough as they are. Um, and this being our first, uh, it, it was a challenge in and of itself, just with the sheer length of the shoot and shooting out of chronology and that being disorienting. And so just being in one house and being able to light for the one house and have it look the same. I mean, at the, the, the one thing I kind of held on to was I was like, at the very least, it's all going to look like it's one movie. It's not going to be like we're trying to match a beach to a downtown to a, you know what I mean? So it was, it was, it was a great way to start. With Emmy, uh, the character of Emmy, there's like sort of this setup that, um, you know, she's in on the robbery and then she, you know, I guess has this change of heart, realizes she wants to protect her father. Um, and then when you guys were developing the script, Peter, was, was she always going to be, um, have this like conscious conscience or was, you know, there a point where she kind of remained evil and like teamed up with Preston or how did the script develop over time? Yeah, so once once I realized, once we realized that the, the nugget of the movie was the father-daughter trying to reconnect amidst the genre trappings, it, 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 there was never really a moment in my mind where I was going to have Ebby just be out and out evil for the rest of the movie. I thought it would be more interesting to have the push-pull and have when they finally are just about, to, just about to reach out to each other somewhat the bomb drops and every the bottom falls out from under them. And that push pull I thought was really interesting. Um, so, so no, to answer your question, no, it was, it was always gonna be that way once we decided the, the meat of the story, yeah. Yeah, and then I mean, with, uh, with Blake too, um, his performance as Reed was just, I mean, you know, his mouth is wired shut so he can't say anything, but he still has this, such an emotional performance. And for you, Alex, how as a director, do you work with, someone who one of their tools is basically just like cut off, you know, one of their main tools. <laughs> I, I, I freaked out initially um, uh, illegitimately because I had this idea in my head that no one would want the role. <laughs> it's <was laughs> like, oh God, what have we done? We've written a role where he can't talk. Uh, it was the opposite for him. He uh, leaped at the opportunity and, and because it was such a challenge. Um, uh, Blake and I worked really closely together. Um, you know, he, he's a really excellent actor and, and, and we were blessed with three. Um, but, but uh, he, he in particular is so experienced. He knows, you know, he, he knows not to push it. He, he, he inherently knows to, he's already so cool as just a dude. And he, and, and, you know, he knew going into it that he didn't need to pantomime and, Oh, no, no. And, you know, it, it was all very in the eyes. Um, um, he's got eyes like a wolf. It's, 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 it's fascinating. It, it, he did a brilliant job. We, we, we had conversations and worked through it, but it was always about just keeping it very, very subtle. Yeah. And we got really lucky with all three of our actors because, you know, we, we shot this in 12 days, which is an insane time to shoot a feature. That's, that's a, we had to do a lot of pages every day. 
And all three actors were incredibly prepared and just ready to rock and roll right out of the gate. And we didn't have to do a lot of takes because they were just so on it and in the character. And and Blake, Natalie, and Betash all just brought it from the get-go. And if they hadn't, I don't know if we'd have been able to finish the movie, frankly. So we are really blessed in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it shows, you know, each one of them, um, like you guys said, with uh, the character of Preston, I mean, fully unhinged and, and absolutely great. Um, I did have one peculiar question, though, um, and I, I wondered if you guys could explain to me the spider, because first of all, I hate spiders. So like watching, I'm literally, that was the only part where I'm like watching with my hand over my face. But was that like his pet? Like, where did that come from? Alex, you want to explain that one? Well, I, it uh, certainly wasn't, I, he probably made it his pet. The, the, <laughs> I, 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 we, Peter and I wanted it to, um, uh, we, we wanted it to be an interpretive uh, element in the story. It, it's, it's a little bit uh, thematic for me. Um, it, it means a lot of things for me. Um, uh, I don't know that it has to mean just one, but the notion of this, creature trapped in a glass um, and is helpless um, uh, is similar to me of, you know, Reed being banished and excommunicated back to his $15 million glass tree house. <laughs> and, he's, and he's emotionally trapped, Reed. Um, uh, Emmy, Emmy as well. Uh, and, and then certainly the most literally, um, Preston, you know, there was this, sleeping dragon of Preston and, and the tarantula that we had, you know, really, I'm terrified of spiders too. And I had to be the spider wrangler just FYI and I didn't like that at all. Um, uh, but, but there was, yeah, there was this sort of beast within um, and, and, and the fear of, of, that, of that spider and, and how scary it looked um, to me um, this beast trapped within. And of course, there's a turning point in the film. I mean, up in, when you meet Preston, you, you get a sense of like, I don't know about this guy. I mean, something's a little off. And then the glass breaks and the spider disappears. And at that point, he totally gives in to sadism and decides to double down and go maniacal so yeah. the beast was unleashed it was just sort of a turning point thematically i suppose yeah and it was also it's it, it, it everything alex just said 100 percent. also it was a microcosm i felt for the things that they had been suppressing their all three characters were su incredibly suppressing a lot of emotions and deep down feelings and the spider, like Alex said, being trapped is just a parallel to that and that emotional tension of slowly ratcheting it up throughout the movie. And then when he breaks free, all their, everything else comes out to light. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I, that's what I was thinking too. And it was also for me with um, Reed specifically and the glass being in the spider and sort of being trapped in this glass mechanism and also hit like the perception of his daughter like of his daughter and him being like kind of like an ugly person in a way I thought that was really interesting but um I have one final question before I go and I just want to know because this was my favorite part of the movie this like I my jaw dropped when this happened but who came up with a zip tie kill and what is wrong with you because <laughs> that was <laughs> that was crazy <laughs> I, I actually can't remember. I think that was, I think we both kind of came to it equally. No, or was that, was that a you thing, Alex? I actually can't remember. It's been so long. Um, I, I'm going to give credit to both of us. Um, uh, but, but um, it, it, it's certainly something that I really loved. Um, I hadn't seen it been done before. I had seen the, you know, gore, filled splatter fast. I had seen the chopping off the head in the instance of hush. I'd seen the corkscrew through the neck and the spray. Uh, that isn't as interesting to me as something that is truly terrifyingly trapping. Once that zip tie goes around the neck and gets yanked, you're done. Yeah. I mean, unless you can get to a pair, I mean, that is so maybe it's not the bloodiest thing in the world, but I, that really disturbed me. 
So it's, that's it's psychologically yeah. disturbing too, like Alex was saying. Yeah, and we, I, I, we both knew from the story standpoint that when Preston did inevitably die, it couldn't just be, you know, a gunshot to the head, boom, he's done. It, it had to be something that mirrored the the slow boil of the movie. And this, just watching him struggle, you know, it mirrored the entire buildup of the movie, I think, nicely. So, yeah. Yeah, and like, you know, we, eyes and like him like sliding down against the wall. I was, uh, that, I was like, I was, da- I was like, damn, like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We, we wired him shut. <laughs> there you go oh, <laughs> <But I'm> sh- <laughs> well uh thank you guys so much for your time today again congratulations on the movie um i really appreciate you guys speaking with me today so thanks so much